you very much. Um, yeah, thank you for the invitation. Um, not much has happened during the last year when we were all in this uh, COVID hibernation, uh, but I have a few new slides. Okay, so treatment of airway stenosis with individualized stents. We heard already there are many uh, different types of airway stenosis and um, there has been pointed out by Nikos and by Hervé that uh, with a rigid bronchoscope you can get rid of most of these obstructions. So if a tumor is growing inside the lumen, you cut it out and as you can see here, once it's cut out, uh, the airway is free and there is not always the need to place a stent. Fact is that we place less stents than we did 10 years ago in all centers. The hype of stent placement is over because we have seen too many complications. Um, a stent is indicated if there's compression from outside and we have to open the airway as fast as possible. The first stents were made from silicone. There was the Montgomery T-tube, uh, but as you all know, it requires a tracheostomy and no patient wants to have a hole in the neck. So the real breakthrough came uh, from Jean-Francois Dumont when he introduced his first indwelling silicone stent. Uh, Hervé uh, talked about it. The Dumont stand in malignant stenosis is right now the gold standard. There have been modifications of these silicone stands and I find them very useful. This, for example, is for right upper low bronchus, uh, a modified uh, silicone stand, the Oki stand. The other story uh, is about the metallic stands. It started with vascular stands, which had been placed in the airways just because they were available. We could take them off the shelf and just put them into the airways. And we have seen many, many complications. I keep showing this slide because this is one of my most horrible cases. I had put a Giantorco stent into the trachea. And as you might uh, uh, appreciate here, it has perforated the esophagus and the aorta. So I had to take the tracheal stent through the uh, esophagus out of the aorta. Uh, was not fun, and I stopped uh, uh, using those stents. Over the years, we have seen all kinds of problems, with, especially with metallic stents, and we consider the material failures, fatigue fractures, squeezing, uh, ruptures, uh, but most important, there were adverse tissue reactions. You can see here big granulation uh, tissue formation at the edges of stents. First, we thought it's the metal, but if we look closer, you see the same thing happens with silicone stents. These are different silicone stents, a dynamic stent and a polymer stent, and you see the same granulation tissue formation at the edges. So it's something more about pressure and friction over the mucosa, this constant irritation. One reason is that we have an underlying shape problem. Uh, all the stands that you've seen are cylindrically round shaped, but stenosis are not. This is a slit. And what happens if you put a round shaped stand into a stenosis, you have a very high, I realize you cannot see the mouse. Uh, okay. Uh, I just went short here. You can see that uh, it does work that way. Um, you see that the uh, pressure uh, from the stand is very localized and pretty high. Oh, sorry, thank you very much. So, uh, yeah. Hmm. 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 Maybe it's empty. Anyway, uh, forget. Oh. oh, that button. Sorry. Okay, here is, here's, the, here's the problem. Okay, and uh, over the years we have seen all these catastrophic results where we placed more and more stents and the stents at the end did more harm uh, than good. So the question is, could a stent that matches the shape better uh, solve the problem? And uh, we started many years ago with anatomically shaped stents that were cut from nitinol. So this was a 3D um, melted stent 
from nitinol wires. It is possible, but expensive and time consuming. And I think the real game changer came with the customized airway stents from polymers. There are several papers, the French group and the uh, Cleveland Clinic group are the most active ones. Uh, you can see here from casts uh, made uh, silicone stents, modified uh, Dumont stents, if you like. Okay, thank you. So uh, here's another group. Uh, they even have a company. You can order uh, a silicone stent when you send in the CT uh, data. And uh, the, this has been uh, very beneficial for patients with very complex stenosis, like in this post-transplant patient, for example. So we had started making these silicone stents by uh, producing a core and dipping that core into silicone. Um, the core was made from uh, CT data or uh, from uh, tracheal casts, and we got these uh, perfectly matching stents. Uh, the uh, more or less industrial way is to make a core and an outer more uh, part and uh, fill the gaps here with silicone. After a few hours, you have perfectly matching silicone stent. And uh, this was one of the first examples. And we heard that uh, gentleman uh, 10 minutes ago, uh, we placed the first one uh, in Marseille in 2016. Um, another friend of mine, um, Tom Gildea in the Cleveland Clinic, has uh, reported the use of these uh, specific silicone stands and he has follow-up data for several years now. Uh, one problem is that the production time of such a good stand is three weeks, which is difficult <laughs> if you have a patient who is short of breath. One way to overcome this might be directly printing. And with directly printing, there are several methods. I'm not going into details for the sake of time, uh, but you have a polymeric uh, material that is melted and printed through a nozzle. And then uh, as you can see here, for example, uh, you can have any data uh, put into the machine and the perfect uh, polymeric substrate comes out. So if you can imagine something, you can draw it, you can print it. Uh, and we had some uh, clinical cases reported for very complex stenosis. Uh, in such a case, uh, a normal stent would not work. Um, other case here, I've shown that before, a fistula between the bronchus and the stomach. So uh, we made these special stents with ceiling rings. And uh, you see the uh, view from the esophagus and from the, uh, from the bronchus, and the fistula could be sealed. Uh, one advantage is uh, in this technique that you can change the wall thickness. You can make uh, a stent stronger here, softer here, so it's not only anatomically optimized, but also biomechanically optimized. When you compare a metal stent and a silicon stent, uh, they have similar recoil forces, they're in the same range. However, the effect on the tissue is different. You have to realize that the blood vessels in the bronchus and the tracheal mucosa are very small. And any pressure here can uh, create a vessel shutdown, which makes uh, uh, or ends up with necrosis. Um, so when you have a stent that has a low contact area, you're asking for trouble. And this is the case when you use a bare metal stent. Here, the vascular system is squeezed. And we try to develop silicone stents or polymeric stents, which have a broader uh, strut. Uh, we failed a little bit, I keep this short, uh, by with regular printing techniques. So what I'm doing now is I print it and then use a laser to cut this stent under uh, argon gas. And 
you see the these type of stents can be cut in any way, diamond shaped or whatever. And the laser pattern uh, reminds us of a, a meshed metal stent, but it's broader and it's softer, so the local uh, pressure is lower. There are alternative techniques uh, with uh, the photopolymerization printers, uh, but the uh, message is the same. Uh, depending on the pattern that we cut into the stent, we can influence the stress-strain curve, in other words, the pressure or the force that the stent is exerting. So we can uh, optimize a stent anatomically, having the proper shape here, an hourglass shape with a flexible posterior membrane. We can make it thicker, thinner, softer, harder, any way you like, right on the spot. Production time is a two, three hours uh, at best, uh, uh, but there are more problems associated with it. At the stent edges, I mentioned that before, we often see granulation tissue formation. And one way to uh, fight this granulation would be using antiproliferative uh, drugs like mitomycin or whatever. Uh, we have done studies here. You might know some of these people. Uh, others work with immune modulating drugs, plenty of opportunities. But I'd like you uh, uh, to, well, I want to show you how I do it. I prepare a stand, and this is the drug. And this drug is coming out of the syringe under 20,000 volts. That creates nanofibers, and these nanofibers can contain, for example, mitomycin, or in case of infection, it can be an antibiotic or whatever. On the surface, we have these nanofibers. You see here, uh, this is uh, a tenth of uh, 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 a micrometer. And the advantage is that we have a huge surface with these thin fibers, which releases the drugs over a long time. So the procedure is we design the stent, uh, print it, cut it, and then coat it with any drug. For the uh, purpose of, um, let's say, constructing, we use the CT data and also the data from the endoscopist. They have to come together and tell them, okay, I need more force. It's uh, no point in having a stent that has the stenosis shape and no point in trying to put in a normal stent because it will not open. We have to find a compromise and that can only happen with a good dialogue uh, between the engineers, the radiologist and the pulmonologist. Uh, this is here uh, in Thessaloniki and we have been able to show that here's the peak that within less than 24 hours, we can have the perfectly matching stent. With these techniques, production is possible. But if you see such a super stand, it may be difficult to place, at least for most of us. Okay, there are exceptions. Uh, Gregorius, um, you should see this slide uh, because you, you might recognize this master. Uh, he is the one who could place such a stand. We others can't. We, we have to do something. And for those, and this is uh, what Nikos has been telling me, I start with uh, building the stenosis. So in a similar technique, I use multi-material. Uh, I prepare the specific problem. Uh, I can create the airway of this patient with a stricture, for example, and then see how we can get the stents in. And I'm working on such a model where I have the uh, bronchial tree and try to place stents or whatever and see what influence it has, uh, it alarms when the pressure is too high and so forth. But you get the message. Um, we try to find a training model for universal uh, purpose, but also for a particular disease. And uh, 
For the same purpose, we have developed special insertion instruments because it's difficult to place these complex tents with normal instruments. Uh, and you see, we do this under uh, the most critical supervision of experts trying to bring this uh, a little bit further. So uh, I'm working on this semi-rigid bronchoscopes uh, where we can place these stents. For example, this patient uh, got uh, a trifurcation stent, trachea, left stem, right stem, and upper low bronchus. It's difficult to place with normal instruments, but with these pre-curved ones that I use here, it was pretty easy. So this is my vision. We can identify the problem. We can print the individual problem. We can produce the anatomically and biomechanically optimized shape. We can coat it with an individual drug, mitomycin, taxol, uh, uh, amoxicillin, whatever. And we can insert this with individualized instruments. This can all be produced within a few hours. This is my lab, and you can see here I have eight 3D printers. I have cell cultures, I have everything, but this is not a medical device company. This is purely experimental. To produce such a stand that can be used in patients is a regulatory nightmare. So there's a huge discrepancy between what is technically feasible in my little garage and what we can do for a patient, because after all, this is an implant and it has to obey all the regulatory uh, I wouldn't say hurdles, uh, rules. Huh? The MDR, which came in place last year and uh, sharply, uh, actually yesterday, yesterday was the cut off day. And in this regulation, this is my last slide, it says the new regulations remove the exceptions from custom made say for any device that are manufactured on an industrial scale and therefore require that they have their own clinical data to demonstrate the sustainability. This could greatly impede the production of personalized uh, devices, despite the fact that they have repeatedly been demonstrated to have positive impacts on surgical. Uh, that means it's feasible, but it's legally not possible. You cannot get data without data. You cannot get uh, approval and so far. Uh, and that's why I have decided to retire this year. So in summary, not everybody does need a stent. Silicon stents have a better safety record. Metal stents in benign stenosis are the very, 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 very last option. Truly customized airway stands that are probably better than any existing device can be produced within hours. Special deployment devices can be made easily. And you can test first before you go to the patient. And at present, regulatory hurdles are mildly speaking discouraging. But there are enough young colleagues who will bring it further and progress will prevail. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent speech, uh, Dr. Friedrich. Any question from the audience? No question? Thank you very much for this excellent uh, talk. Uh, maybe we have some time at the end. We will have one or two questions.